Hello and welcome to Switzer TV. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining us. Now on the program tonight, I've got my Gable, our charters, to look at some companies that are really moving in the right direction. Companies that have benefited from a bit of a tech rebound, particularly in the US. So we're going to look at Lime Town Resources. It's under takeover offer at the moment. You've got Megaport, rose 41% on Friday. Uh, Ordinate, a very interesting company. Um, Champion Iron, Harvey Norman and Bank of Queensland. So I've got Mike Gable looking at the charts first. And then I've got Adam Dawes of Shore and Partners to look at what the stockbrokers are saying about these companies. And then I finish off with Deanna Mussina, uh, an economist from AMP, to see what she thinks is going to happen with interest rates tomorrow, uh, what's going to happen to the stock market, should we be preparing for a recession here or in the US, and overall, what are, what are the conditions for investing right now. That's the program, so let's kick off now with uh, Mike Gable of Fairmont Equities. Welcome to the program, Mike. Thank you. So um, I'm surprised how well the market's been doing. I'm really happy it is. But what is the chart saying? Is it making? Is it a good reason to be uh, optimistic? I think so. Look, I think there's a, a couple of major things worth pointing out. So um, daily chart of the S&P 500. Last time we were here, um, I pointed out that it seemed to be bouncing pretty well off, off a major support level. Mm. Um, and this is during that whole banking crisis scenario yeah, from a month yeah, ago. And, yeah. and if you were to look at a chart, you'd almost wouldn't pick where it was. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just been going about its its business, of course. Um, as we could see, since the October low, we've been making higher lows. Mm. Um, in terms of what it's doing at the moment, I think it looks very encouraging. So the S&P 500's rallied fairly well. Um, it looked like last week it was breaking down, but to me, this very sort of short-term area here, it looks like it was a bit of a bear trap where everyone thought, oh, here we go, it's going to roll over. Mm. And the last couple of days were very strong. So it's right back at this, um, near this resistance level near mm. 4,200. Um, I think it'll try to break through that and then we're looking at, at 4,300. So look, ultimately it's it's not giving me any signs that there's a big, big sell-off underway. Yeah, I, I guess the Fed and its next interest rate decision and the, the narrative that comes mm. is going to be a, a, a test. But the point I like is that you're saying we're seeing higher lows, which means that the overall feeling is the US economy and corporate profits are kind of going to be a, a lot better than was probably expected around October when it started to move. Yeah, per perfect point. I was going to mention this whole October period. So a lot of uncertainty back there. We didn't know what inflation was doing, yeah. what was happening with interest rates. Um, yes, there are some new issues being spoken about, the banking um, the issues with the banks over in the US. Mm. But I think we've come a long way and the market's just reflecting that. So I think the worst is behind us. Mm. Um, and I think ahead of us, uh, things are looking a lot better. Let's go to the ASX 200. Uh, I'll, I'll be surprised if we're m much different. So mm. what, what are we seeing here? I actually think this chart looks very bullish. Oh, so really? the thing You can is, come again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the consensus view at the moment is earnings, there's going to be an issue with earnings because there's a recession on the way um, and the market's got to be dip ahead of it hmm. um, and the share market must be smoking something because it's not going down. Yeah. Now to me it feels as though um, that, that that narrative is, is just way too common so hmm. it, it's almost as though people are speaking with fairly you know they're fairly certain that we are going to get a recession the market always comes down when you get a recession hmm. and earnings will fall off a cliff. Well I think we need to be open to the fact that maybe that doesn't happen. I yeah. just think everyone's way too one-sided mm. and they're not preparing for a situation where, you know, maybe we don't get a recession or we get a recession, but the market has already bottomed. Yeah. Or it's mild um, or it's a, sl a slowdown, but not qu quite a recession. Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. I mean, reporting season in the US at the moment, so far it's better than expected. Yeah. Um, so I think we just need to be aware that the market may well surprise on the upside. And when I look at this daily chart, sorry, the weekly chart of the, the Aussie market, we're very close to that sort of all-time high period um, level, which is near 7,600. Mm. 
So from a charting point of view, the more you spend up near a particular level, mm. the weaker it becomes. So if that's a resistance level, there's a strong chance that if we spend more time up here, we'll break through it and we'll be th into the 8,000s mm. this time next year. Mm. Um, same with the support level. If we kept hitting, continue to hit a support level, um, you weaken it mm. and, and you, you fall through it. So to me, this looks like we're setting up for a big move higher. Mm. Um, and we only have to think back to 2020 COVID. I remember mm. when we bounced here, mm. the narrative at the time was you'll get a retest. Markets always retest their lows. Mm. We're mm. still in lockdown. Why yep. would the market go higher? Whereas as we know, it went higher. And around this period of time was when the US, about six months after the lows, was trading at an all-time high. Mm. And again, no one could understand it. It didn't make sense. Surely the market will fall. Yeah. And as you, as you could see with our market, um, once the US went to new highs and we broke through this level here, yeah. where everyone was calling for a dip, mm. every, you had to step into the market. So yeah. if you're still sitting there with cash, yeah. you, had to, you had to get in. I've, I've got a feeling we're going to potentially see a similar situation where later this year we realise the market's not rolling over. It's, mm. We're at all-time highs. It doesn't make sense. And a lot of people with cash, a lot of fund managers with cash, they're going to have to start moving mm. into the market and you'll end up with this sort of movement. So not, not necessarily a prediction, but mm. I just don't think enough people are open-minded to the fact that yeah. might happen and they're not prepared. Your gut feeling is telling you that there's happen. a good chance it could happen. And what, I know, look, I know you're a futurist and you, you just surprised me with your memory of history, but November 2020, what was one of the big takeoff reasons? Vaccines. Vaccines showed up around November of that time. I remember, I was, um, um, what's his name, Chris Joy. Chris, was, Chris Joy actually predicted around November that we'd get the vaccines and bang, they came and the market said, you little beauty. So yeah. as long as we don't get some opposite curveball effect, I think you're probably yeah, on the well, money. Yeah, there might be some positive event. It mm. could be rate cuts. Could there be. could be something out there that makes, you know, it, it could be, a large, a larger than expected drop in inflation. Yeah. Um, and before you know it, where we've got this situation where everyone in cash is chasing mm. the market. You and I never speculate like this. I'm, <laughs> I'm enjoying this. Let's go to a company now, Lion Town Resources. Yep. And uh, it's been chased. Mm -hmm. It's had a nice big, big rise. What's happening now? Um, yeah, we could see we could see the movement up with the um, the takeover offer. Mm. Uh, it's edged higher as the market's been anticipating a bit more of an offer. There's not really much to read at this stage. Look, if it was me, I'd be happy to take it. I think the risk is that it falls through mm. and you lose all of this just to gain a little bit up there. Mm. Um, so profit, yeah, ta profit taking time, time for you? Time to take the profit. Okay. I thought I'd, I'd love to, I, w I wanted to see what you were thinking because there's an interesting chart on you would be looking good too. Let's go to Megaport. Now Megaport was one, you know, I've been asked you to watch. So mm. I was perplexed why it couldn't, uh, it just couldn't get out of its rut up 41% on Friday. W yep. What are you seeing here of Megaport now? So I guess what's interesting this time around, so what I've got at the bottom here is the, um, uh, the volume. And as I've pointed out with Megaport before on the way down, what's made it look so negative is these big spikes in volume more often than not coincided with very large sell-offs. Yeah. Um, whereas this time we've actually seen a lot of volume come in on the way up, which is a positive. Yeah. So I think, look, it's early days. I think if you see it at least hang around these levels in the next few days, mm. um, then I think that's an important first step. And the reason why I say that is because every other time it's rallied, we could see that everyone started to use that as an opportunity to sell it. Yeah. I mean, even during this bounce up here on volume, which was the only other occasion, we saw big volume on the way up. It only managed to keep going for a few days before getting sold into. So, mm. I mean, my advice here would be if it holds up, then you start to feel a bit more positive. Mm. But I'd use this, say, say the low from Friday as your stop level. So... Mm. You don't want to see a situation like here where it starts to get moving, but then it gets back into the downtrend. So look, an early, mm. um, an early positive sign, but mm. for me, it'd still be a bit too early to get. Yeah, too and, and the analysts, the consensus rise still is supportive of the company, about sixty percent. But in that sixty percent, there's some who believe that there's a hundred percent upside. You can mm. see it was a twenty-two dollar stock. Be interesting. I'd like to get Bevan Slattery's return to the company. 
uh, one of the early founders. Mm. The CEP thinks AI is going to have a, an impact because all these tech companies that have any AI implication are really going for a big ride at the yeah. moment. Let's go to Ordinate now, AD8. So fairly interesting, well, I think it's interesting the mm. way this one's, this one's trading because it's been giving us a fairly clear range since early March. So we've had, we've had the bounce up in October, it pulled back, rallied back up to that peak uh, and then it's been trading in a range. So it's consolidating here. We could see there's mm -hmm. always a bit of selling every time it gets near $9, mm -hmm. but also equally some good buying near 850. So for me, it's quite simple. It's a case of it closes above $9. Mm -hmm. That's a buy because it means we've eliminated all the sellers. Mm -hmm. Um, otherwise, a drop below 850 is a sell because mm. it just means that the buy the dip brigade are out of ammo and uh, and that's it and it might fall. So, yeah. a very, I, I like I like seeing stocks that have a very clear range mm. like that. It just makes it easier to pick your buy or sell points. It, it makes me think that you know when there is a, a, a conclusion that tech stocks are going to rebound heavily. Sure, the big ones already are, mm. but when there's a, a wider acceptance. I think a company like ADA will be a beneficiary. Yeah. Let's go to um, Champion Iron. Now, iron ore um, mm -hmm. miners had, had a rough time recently. This is a company that's done fantastically well. What's the um, chart saying to you now? Yeah, we've looked at this one, I think, a couple of times yeah. in the videos at various points. I think last time I was here was in March. And at that point, it was trading within this range. So you, I've put the lines back here. Yeah. Um, so at the time, it looked like it was consolidating alongside that high, mm. and it was just a case of waiting for an upside break or a downside break. Unfortunately, mm. this one's broken to the downside. It tried to get back into the range, but it is slipping. So this chart does look negative, in my opinion. Um, I'm not negative on iron ore. I think no. if you were to pull up, say, the chart of Fortescue, it looks similar to this. I was going to say exactly However, that. Yeah. It just doesn't have this breakdown here. Uh, Fortescue is still trading within its yeah. range. But it, it has, a, it has a pretty, pretty big range, doesn't it? Because it's been yeah. very volatile. But yeah, I, I suspect it's a, it's, it suffers because iron ore prices are down. There's question marks over China. Yep. Interesting to see if it rebounds if uh, things improve. Mm. Let's go. This one is a strange one, Harvey Norman. And I yeah. wrote a piece for the Switzer Report and I was looking for just one old-fashioned, good quality company that might be worth buying. And I th look, looking at the history of Harvey Norman, it seemed like it was a good time to buy it, given the fact that the dividend seems to be really big and when the share price is really low, it, yeah. it goes up. But I wanted to see what the charts were saying about Harvey Norman. Um, I, I do think this can bounce in the short term. Mm -hmm. um, sort of medium to longer term, I'm not sure yet. I need to see more evidence that it's found a low. But mm -hmm. The reason why I think it'll potentially bounce in the short term is we could see, firstly, it has fallen all the way back to that June low and it is holding in. Mm. Um, but the range has been tightening up a bit, which is usually a precursor to uh, a sharp move. So, mm. you know, sharp moves down here, starting to die off as it, as it sort of tightens up the range. What I've got here is an indicator, um, the RSI. Um, yeah, viewers can Google it, but essentially it, it's a measure of momentum. Right. Looking at the the ranges of the um, <coughs> the previous, in this case, it's 14 days. But essentially, what you what I'm looking at here with the RSI is um, whether you have any divergence with price. So mm. what I mean by that is, we could see at this point the price has been heading lower, but interestingly, the RSI bottomed in early May mm. and has been trending higher. Yeah. So that's divergence where price is going down, but momentum's going up. And yeah. often the, the share price will then start to catch up to this. So I think we're only actually a few days away from, from seeing Harvey Norman make a bit of a run up towards yeah. the, the high threes. Beyond that, I'll have to yeah. reassess. And it just but seems to me that if I was a, div a dividend fund manager, I'd be thinking, well, why wouldn't I buy it now and just put it aside? It mm. might take me a couple of years to see the share price improve, but I'm going to get a pretty good dividend out of old Jerry. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And if you're looking, yeah, if you're looking to buy it, I'd say this setup is telling me now's the time to. Yeah. to do and it. it's rebounded every time it goes to a low. Eventually, cre creeps mm. its way out. And I think it, when interest rates are cut, retail companies will be loved again. 
and retail companies have done well anyway. Yeah. Uh, many of them have, unlike unlike Jerry. But um, I think when they cut rates, probably in 2024, they'll start forgiving them, and the share price will probably sneak up, mm. and you're sitting on a nice dividend. Um, and this is one that's really copped it. BAQ. Yeah. What's going on there? Well, I thought I'd um, pull up a monthly chart going back almost 20 years, just to put it in perspective. As we could see, that was mm. that was the GFC, not um, mm. not COVID. So we could mm. see it just never just never recovered, yeah. um, like NAB. Um, so you know, there's good banks and there's bad banks, and unfortunately. Yeah, it'd be nice if our banking system was more competitive, but the mm. reality is you've got the big four and the, the regionals just can't yeah. can't compete. So, yeah, sure. um, you know, the share price looks looks terrible, and unfortunately, um, you know, I think a lot of a lot of research into banks like this usually, when they have it as a buy recommendation, it's usually based on valuation, you know, valuation compared to peers. But we could see over time. Mm. Yeah, it's cheap for a reason. Mm. Um, yeah, just one one big downtrend, unfortunately. Even most recently, has really started to accelerate on the downside. So, I'd steer clear of of this. Um, CBA and Macquarie, if you're looking for financials, are the standouts. Yeah. Okay, your favourite for this week. Yep. So I've got IGO. So I'm still, you know, very positive on on the resources mm. on the resources sector. So. Yeah. I like the iron ore stocks down here. I think lithium stocks have bottomed. Um, I think coal's looking good. Whitehaven coal looks like it's heading higher. Mm. Um, I spoke about gold before Christmas, and I promised I'd let everyone know when mm. when I've sold. I've sold my gold stocks in the last couple of weeks. Mm. Newcrest and Evolution. They're still around the same levels. Yeah. Um, what are you thinking? What you think? Is it purely the charts? We've got some fundamental analysis as well. Bit of bit of gut feel as well. So look, they. Up until a couple of weeks ago, they ran pretty hard, mm. um, but it also feels as though everyone is is bullish gold at the moment. So mm. to me, it just feels feels like that's a crowded trade. Mm. Um, you know, maybe we get a short term bounce in the U.S. dollar and, yeah. and gold suffers for for well, a little bit. What does gold do when inflation is rising? It's popular. So the the problem with so there's a few things. I, I think the made one of the major uh, factors to look at is, is the US dollar. So when the US dollar goes down, um, gold price goes up. Um, the problem with gold is it doesn't earn you a, um, income. A, an income. Mm. So when the rates are going up, um, that's a problem. But if it does look like, look, ultimately I think gold can, can do well. So in inflationary periods, to come back to your question, mm. I think it can do well mm. um, from here. I think mm. that if rates have peaked, and therefore that's less downwards pressure on gold. Mm. Um, and I think that if the market is going to get a bit more excited later in the year, then you'll have less money going into the US dollar as a safe haven, and therefore the US dollar will drop, and that will be positive for gold. Mm. I don't think gold's good as a, um, as a safe haven in its own. I think mm. the US dollar's the better safe haven. So I think if you're buying gold because you're worried about what the banks are doing in the US and so on, I think that's, that's not going to work out. Uh, but look, ultimately, I think there's potential for gold to do well later in the year. But at yeah. the moment, it just feels like a bit of a crowded trade. Sorry, sorry. Um, but yeah, look, just quickly coming back to IGO. Um, so nickel and lithium, to me, it looks like those stocks have, have bottomed and are starting to head up again. This particular one, we saw a bit of heat come out of the share price. Um, in terms of the chart, so it started, the range started to tighten up here and then it bounced up towards a major resistance level near $13. And I can see that there was a bit of selling as it got near there, but then it pushed through. So that was the major buy signal. The other thing I like about this one, and we're holding this for clients as well, of course, um, last Friday it had their quarterly result. And what's it's interesting to see how stocks react to a result that may be perceived as good or bad. Interesting to see on the day it was initially sold off in the morning because there were a couple of headlines such as a um, you know, write down with the Western areas operation and so on, only for the stock to recover by the end of the day. Mm. Um, today it's fairly flat, it's a bit of a mixed day on the market, but just interesting to see as it got back near that support level at $13, the buyers stepped in. So I quite like the, the way this chart's looking and I still think there's further upside in IGO. Okay, Mike Gable, thanks for joining us. Thanks. Thank you.
Well, joining me now is Adam Dawes of Shore and Partners. And I want to ask him about the stocks that I was talking to Mike Gable about. Great to see you, mate. Yes, yeah, great to see you too. It's fantastic to be here. Yeah, okay. Let's go through some of the stocks that I've given you a bit of a heads up on. I've got Mike Gable to look at the charts. First one, Line Town Resources. It went for a big ride recently. It's in the lithium space. Someone, someone wants to buy it. Uh, how does someone play Line Town if they've made money at this point in time? Do they hang on or do they take profit? It's a tough one, isn't it? It really comes down to that takeover side of things. Generally with takeovers, they can take up to three to six months to actually continue to go through. So is your money best placed in something that's going to hold or have a pretty much a holding pattern for those three or six months? And then it goes down to, will the ACCC allow it to come through or allow it to happen? As well as then, they also talk then about FERB, which is the Foreign Investment Review Board. Will they allow it to go through also? So there's a lot of hurdles that actually need to come through at the time of the takeover. But also the downside is, is that it can potentially be sort of a, you know, with the, the stock rising, it can be a, a sort of a 50% uh, fall in the share price on the downside. If you think there's going to be another bid, potentially it's only around about a 10% uh, on the upside. So something like a new crest we've been selling because we don't think that anybody else is going to come in to take a uh, new crest over. However, Liontown, uh, I always say this wrong, Albemare uh, is one of the largest uh, South American uh, lithium businesses, and they're looking to continue to keep getting uh, these lithium deposits. Liontown certainly has done well, and uh, look, it looks interesting. I think that you'd probably take some money and run on Liontown here. I don't think you'd need to wait around. I don't think there's going to be a high bid. If there is, um, well, it, as I said, it's only going to go up uh, uh, another sort of 10%. So I'd be careful with this one. I think that uh, Lion Town would be a good one to get out of and then put some money where you can see it grow further. Okay. Let's go to one that did grow further on Friday, Megaport, uh, a company that I've always liked because the analysts really liked it. Uh, I was very happy to see that 41% rise. What do we do now? Do we... Do we hang in there or do we take a bit of profit? No, I think the, 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 the business is still undervalued, even despite the recent surge in the share price. I really do. I think this is one that is going to do well. Look, it's certainly got the growth side of things. And yesterday, or sorry, Friday or Thursday, we, Friday, we saw um, the shorters starting to cover the stock. So you, that's why you got this sort of really big uplift. It's just turning a corner, potentially turning more of a profit now, but not a large one. It's off coming off a really low base. I think you look at even most of the tech businesses have started to turn a corner now. I really think that that is probably something that you'd be more comfortable with. I think you hold on to Megaport. I mean, if you've had it like I have in my portfolio for a long time, I think you, you'd you be comfortable to keep going with it. It does look like that's turning that corner. Most of the brokers out there have sort of price targets of $8.50, yeah. uh, Goldman Sachs uh, and uh, Morgan Stanley around that sort of level. So I, I think you'd be okay holding on to it. I think the tech side of it, you'll see more of that coming through into the new year next year and if interest rates start to come back i mean i think tech is definitely on so i'd be happy to hold megaport an interesting uh tech company as well is ordinate ad8 um yeah. i like the company but you know it's, it's taken a while to to, to kick up what, what do you reckon yeah this is one of our analysts most favorite stocks in the world and he said if he <laughs> if he only only looked at one stock this would be the one yeah. So, uh, you know, it did it did come back down after COVID on supply chain issues. A lot of their uh, products and services are made in China. So you've got to be a little bit careful there. But I think that supply chain issue has now been moved forward. They've got some fantastic technology. Their Dante technology is really uh, disrupting the way uh, that um, businesses and audio is, is basically uh, been moved around. Basically, taking all of the, the the cables out of the um, out of the big air arenas and putting it into digital, and you imagine how heavy a lot of those cables are across uh, very large arenas, mm. uh, as well as train stations and everything else. So the technology is there. I really like it. Uh, I'm going to stick with my analysts on this one. It's certainly a buy. 
uh, and uh, has done well and can, will continue to do well with some of their ancillary services that they're now starting to sell once they've put the Dante products in to these large organisations. Let's go to Champion Iron now. It's had a fantastic run. Uh, I suspect it's gone off the boil because iron ore prices have gone off the boil. But what's your view on the company? Yeah, so they've ramped up production. Uh, they're 15 million tonnes uh, per annum now uh, starting to come through. The quarterly was actually good. The production numbers were up uh, around about 65%. Just got to be a little bit careful with Champion Iron. You look at that, it, it's around $79 their, their cash costs to produce a tonne of iron ore. Whereas, you know, you've got the BHPs, Rios and Fortescues of the world that can produce a tonne of iron ore for around $20. Hmm. So you've just got to be careful. Iron ore sort of skirting around that $100 level at the moment. These marginal producers, when I say marginal, that if, if the iron ore price does come back to $80, even lower, these guys aren't going to be making any money. And you watch that share price really get hit pretty hard. So I'd just be cautious with the marginal producers at the moment. I think you, you'd rather stick with the big three, Rio, BHP and Fortescue for a little bit of safety. But yeah, I mean, if iron ore does stay around 100, 120, then it's okay. But I'd just be cautious on that one at the moment. Okay. I, I wrote a story uh, recently where I was looking for like a, a really sort of safe, old-fashioned type stock and ended up with HVN. Uh, and probably because... Yeah, Jerry tends to pay a very good dividend and the share price yeah. has really fallen down. So, yeah. you know, for those people chasing income, you know, is HVN a buy at these levels? Yeah, look, I had a client the other day, Remy, and say, well, what do you think about it? And I said, look, um, fantastic business, uh, the property, because he owns most of the properties that, that, are, that, are, that are there. So it's a property trust more than it's a discretionary retailer side mm -hmm. of things. I said, look, the dividend I'd say would be somewhat safe going forward. And certainly Harvey Norman uh, knows how to sort of pull those strings as well. The dividend yield is okay. I mean, he went and bought some stock in there. I said, the only thing is, is that potentially you're just going to have to wait another six, maybe 12 months until consumer discretionary stocks now then start to come back into favour. But yeah. if you're comfortable and if you've got a longer term view, Harvey Norman's not too bad at the moment. Okay. All right, before we finish up, BOQ's had a shocker. Is it ever going to turn around? Is it a buy at these levels or is it just forget it? Forget it. Yeah, um, look, I, I, I'm, always, I'm always staying in the big four. Uh, the regionals are price takers, not price makers. So they, in other words, when they go out to get their funding, they really can't uh, take, uh, they have to take whatever they can get on the price for their funding. Their net interest margins, we saw with Commonwealth Bank, we've got the big other three banks going to report this week. So it'd be really interesting to see what their net interest margins are or their NIMS. But certainly, yeah, BOQ uh, undervalued, uh, sorry, underperform. It, it, it does look like that it will continue to stay in the doldrums until they can sort of go forward. I think Suncorp looks interesting when they're selling their bank uh, to ANZ, if that's ever going to go through. But yeah, I, I, I stay away from the regionals. Well, I'm a quarry, mate. You know that. It's a, it's yeah. a fantastic business. You'll never go wrong. Yeah, it's just that, you know, you, you said the big four. You really mean the big five, don't you? Yeah. Exactly right. I've heard the big five. Yes. Yeah. All right, mate. Thanks for joining us. Take care. And that was Adam Dawes of Shore and Partners, of course. And coming up now is Deanna Messina, who's a senior economist with AMP. And I really want to know what she thinks is going on with the economy and the markets going forward. Well, let's start off with the question that a lot of people watching this program would really want to know the answer to. And it is, will the Reserve Bank raise interest rates tomorrow? We don't think that we'll see another rate rise from the RBA. So we expect the cash rate to be on hold at 3.6% at the May board meeting. And the key reason behind that view is really around the fact that we've seen a slowing inflation in Australia that's actually been faster than where the RBA was expecting it to be at this stage. That was confirmed with the latest March inflation figures. We've also seen some pockets of stress in the banking system globally in the US. That is a risk for further contagion into Australia. We've seen some signs of slowing in key leading indicators of the labour market here. And putting that all together, I think the RBA is willing to tolerate inflation being higher than its target band because it clearly is at the moment, but to preserve jobs growth 
in that process. It doesn't want to take rates too high if we're going to risk a big increase in the unemployment rate and potentially a recession. I think it's more tolerant of higher inflation compared to some of the other global central banks. Okay, so looking at, and I've got to say, I've written a number of times, this is the fastest increase in monetary policy ever, but I actually saw a chart of it the other day and it's it was vertical and it's, all the other ones were maybe lots of steps, but in steps, this is extraordinary when you look at it graphically, how, how vicious this interest rate rise um, um, period has been. Yeah, that's right. Was that was that actually one of um one of one of our charts because we um have that one as well, and it it really shows you the difference in this monetary tightening cycle compared to any other, mm. and that just goes to the point that there's more downside to come from high interest rates. Even if the RBA doesn't take rates any higher from here, don't forget that there is a massive lag response from when the RBA raises the cash rate or cuts the cash rate to when there's actually an impact to the economy. And that impact from rate rise, from the latest rate rise that we had in March is still flowing through in Australia. People on fixed rates are still about to roll off. I just rolled off one of my own fixed rates. About nearly 900,000 loans are due to roll off this year. And the impacts from those variable rate rises will still flow on into parts of the economy. So there is more pain to come for households. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask you about the mortgage cliff. To me, there's a real big question mark, isn't it? Because historically, uh, fixed rates were about 15% of total loans. They, they've been they've got around 40%. At the peak of the pandemic, yes, they they peaked at about 40% of the total loan book. At the moment, they look like they're about 30% because some of those fixed rates in the past one year or one to two years have rolled off now. But yeah. there is still a massive amount of fixed rates that are due to roll off and those households will uh, their, their, their interest rates will move from probably sub two percent to five five and a half percent or five percent really if they're lucky it'll be five and a half to six percent really so two to three times what they fixed at on our calculations for an average household you're looking at about an extra fifteen thousand dollars a year in mortgage repayments which i think is a big is a big chunk of money that needs to be factored in by household. That's a, he has a huge cutback in discretionary spending. Yeah. I know a, a um, CEO of a listed company who's actually taking his uh, lunch to work nowadays, which I think is a, a great real life indication that spending is going to be reduced over the next six months or so in particular. Australia in a recession, what's the AMP view? Look, I think you have to clearly say that the risks of a recession are very high in Australia, and that risk is probably about 50%, but you know, there's a time frame on this. Are we going to have a recession right now, or will it happen next year? I think th the bigger risk is that it happens next year if the RBA has to hold the cash rate at a higher level than, than what you know, most households are used to. So if we get to the situation at the end of the year where inflation's come down dramatically, which we expect, you know, running about 4% or so, which is half its rate that it was at the beginning of the year, but the RBA still holds the cash rate at a high level, then you will continue to see negative impacts on households through interest rates being you know, at an elevated level. And that could risk further uh, downside impact to the economy. Or we could also see the situation where inflation has a bit of a rebound. If we see the RBA pulling back on not hiking rates anymore and consumers get comfortable, maybe there is some fundamental underlying strength in the consumer that we're underestimating. High accumulated savings, lead market still holds up and inflation could have a bit of a rebound and we could see wages growth increasing again, which could see the RBA tightening. So, I think that there's more of a risk of a recession next year in Australia. And you'd have to say that that risk is still 50% or so, like it is in all the other major advanced countries. Okay, US and recession. I think the, the risks for the US are also pretty similar uh, as, as, as Australia. And it's really uh, the same factors that will weigh into the ultimate outcome of whether the US will or will not have a recession. The Fed has obviously taken rates to a much higher level than the RBA. The RBA has done 350 basis points. The Fed will probably do about 500 basis points once, once their tightening cycle has finished. 
So obviously much larger rate rise in the US, but don't forget that monetary policy works differently in the US in the way that it flows through into the mortgage market, into the housing market. Most households in the US fix their rates for 30 years and they can they have fixed at much lower rates compared to Australian households. So if you have mortgage debt there, you probably won't be feeling the impacts of Fed rate rises because you've already fixed your rate. It only really impacts those marginal households that are just getting into the into the mortgage market or have to refinance. And of course, it impacts businesses. The outlook for stocks. What, what are you guys thinking for the rest of this year? We're pretty neutral uh, on on the outlook for the share market. I mean, since the beginning of the year, Australian shares have actually done quite well. You know, we have seen. Uh, pretty much growth in the share market that we would have expected for this whole calendar year. And there's, if you run through a list of all the potential negatives for the share market, there's clearly still a lot, which means that volatility in shares will remain quite high. And because the risk of a recession is still so high in the next 12 to 18 months, and a lot of those typical recession indicators, like the yield curve, leading indicators, the Fed funds rate versus inflation and nominal growth, all those typical leading indicators of a recession are, are clearly in a recessionary camp. So in that environment, I think you have to be cautiously positioned because you could still see a lot of downside to shares and you will see downside if there is recession. Usually recessions coincide with the bear markets in, in, in shares. So if we do see a recession play out, then shares could fall another 20%, maybe even more than that. That's why looking at the timing of a recession, I think is still really important. So overall, pretty neutral for the rest of the year. Uh, we thought that shares would, would increase by about 7 or 8% this year as a whole, and they've already done quite well since the beginning of the year. So some, maybe some further near-term downside as you have these risks popping up like the US debt ceiling, maybe more concerns about the banking system, and then maybe some more upside by by the end of the year, but but overall, um, not uh, we're not expecting a big fall in shares this year. But that fall is likely to happen when that recession occurs. Okay, to try and uh, flesh out the the most optimistic potential scenario, would it rest on inflation falling nicely over the the course of this year, and the Reserve Bank recognizing that. Um, possibly the impact of their 10 rate rises plus the mortgage cliff is potentially putting us into a, a recession for 2024 and then they cut interest rates. If that kind of scenario came about, would you then become even more positive for stocks for 2024 if they're cutting rates and we, there's no guarantee of a serious recession? That is probably the most optimistic scenario, but you would want to see inflation and inflation risks really come down. So no signs of a wage price spiral, no further uh, you know, concern that you're going to get one-off supply shocks in the process or a big increase in consumer demand because if the RBA is cutting rates or the central bank is cutting rates, then consumers might have another increase in spending. So inflation and the outlook for inflation would have to be uh, you know, very very well down from where from where it has been and you would need to see projections for inflation to be back within the central bank's target band uh, to be optimistic that the central bank could be cutting rates mm. or is cutting rates so uh, the stars really have to align for that environment to occur and I think the problem here is that the recession indicators are all pointing to a downturn sometime in the next one to two years or even six months to, to two years and is it is it possible that all the indicators are wrong at once i don't think so i think that there is still this big risk that we do get a downturn next year because it's very unlikely that that all the indicators that we usually look at for a recession can be this wrong they usually have been pretty good guides to the future but they do have very long you know lead and lag time so you have to be cautious about the timing yeah and I guess the, the point is we, we haven't seen interest rates rise so quickly and therefore we may well see interest rates be cut even quickly because it's, it's historically a very different um, playbook for monetary policy, both here and in the US. 
And the one thing that surprised me, and I'm sure it surprised you as well, um, is that a lot of economic indicators still look pretty good, you know, um, despite the fact that some look pretty, pretty scary. And also your own pipeline inflation indicators kind of suggest that we could get a real shock and inflation could plunk and fall pretty quickly over the next, say, three to four months. Is that a fair call? I mean, our pipeline indicator has been falling for months now, and that's why we've been continually saying inflation is going to come down. You're going to see deflation in some pockets. But it, I think this time around it's probably led the normal inflation cycle more than usual. Our pipeline indicator is a really good guide to goods inflation, but services has really been the component that's been stickier. So that's why I think our pipeline indicator has moved a lot faster than the, the overall inflation figures because services prices has still been quite sticky, particularly in the US where they do have a wages problem, a wage breakout problem. We don't have that same problem here in Australia. We, we could get it if the public service decides to completely uh, increase the wage caps quite significantly. And if we do get the minimum wage decision and EBA agreements at the level of inflation. So we could still see that wage breakout here uh, but overall, I think that inflation is going to surprise the downside in coming months massively. People with um, um, big borrowings and high interest rates will hope you're absolutely right. Thanks for joining us. And look, there's a dear little Thank you so much. right beside us as well. <laughs> the little one's sick, yeah. <laughs> Great to see you, Deanna. Thank you so much, Peter. Bye. That's the program for tonight. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget, you can go to the Switzer Report. You'll have to become a subscriber to access some of the stories there, or all the stories, really. And uh, But if you can't do that, go to Switzer Daily. That's where I, I write every day. Uh, but I would love you to become subscribers to the Switzer Report. I'll see you next Monday.